In the early hours of the 25th of February 2000, a young child was brought to the intensive care unit of a central London hospital with signs of horrific physical abuse. It was incredibly difficult to comprehend how anybody could do that to a child. Despite the best efforts of the medical team, the girl died later that day. She was eight years old. The pathologist who carried out the post-mortem discovered injuries to every part of her body. As he put it, there wasn't a part of her that was spared. The cause of her death and the investigation into how it was allowed to happen led to the most extensive inquiry into child protection in British history. It was a crime that shook Britain. St Mary's Hospital, London, and an eight-year-old girl was declared dead after a 13-hour battle for life. It was immediately clear to the doctors who tried to save her that the young child had been subjected to the most appalling treatment. The doctors there talk of her core temperature being so low they couldn't actually read the temperature on their normal equipment. When Dr Curry examined her after she died, he found in excess of 120 injuries in her body. I mean, this poor child had, had had fought these conditions for so many months, but eventually her body just gave up. Suspicion immediately began to fall on the child's guardians. Marie Therese Coelho, who was her apparent carer, she was arrested at the time. And following her arrest, a day later, her boyfriend, Carl Don Manning, was arrested at the flat in Tottenham. And this is when the event started to begin to be unraveled. It soon became clear to detectives that almost everything they thought they knew about the dead girl was wrong, even down to her identity. Only when police began to question the suspects did the real story begin to emerge, starting with the child's name, Victoria Climbier. Victoria was born on the 2nd of November 1991 in Abobo, the village where she was brought up, which is a small village in Ivory Coast. She was a really happy child, sang all the time, danced about a lot. She was a central figure within her family. She was very helpful. She was the entertainer um, of the family. Shortly before her seventh birthday, Victoria and her family were visited by Mary Therese Quao, who was Victoria's great aunt on her father's side. Quao was 42 and had lived in France for some years. In October 1998, she returned to the Ivory Coast with a proposition for the Climbier family. She offered to take one of their children back to France and have the child educated. This seemed to be an offer that would bring prosperity for uh, Victoria. So they were happy with this and this is a process that takes place in that area of the world on a regular basis and it's tried and trusted and this was, this was a relative. Quao was somebody that they knew well she was the head of the family at the time. She was a French citizen, apparently, from their perception, incredibly wealthy. One of the analogies that's been suggested to me is, you know, somebody offering you, say, to send your child to, you know, Eton or Harrow and then educate them at Oxbridge and all that that would provide. And of course it's like that, but of course it's even greater. It's a much greater advantage than that. The kind of opportunity that would change your child's life forever. In a twist of fate, it seems that Victoria was not the original child chosen by her aunt to take to Europe. She had in mind another child initially, who was called Anna, went out to the Ivory Coast with a view to recruiting Anna, and Anna's parents said no. But Quao had already got the name Anna in her passport as her daughter, so that when she then subsequently recruited from the Climbier family, she didn't want to change the passport, so she just called Victoria Anna. Now she had a child of a different name, so she had to attempt to defraud the authorities into believing that the child on the passport was in fact Anna Cueillon, so she did that by obtaining some hair extensions and got her through the passport controls and the various border controls and went to Paris. Quao took Victoria to Paris in November 1998. They stayed for approximately five months. While she was in Paris, uh, she lived in an apartment provided by the state. Uh, she was given benefits and, uh, and Victoria went to school. 
although she only went to school for about 50% of the time uh, because of the assaults and the abuse had started at that point. And the authorities in France started to take a very close look at this and started to threaten action because Victoria wasn't going to school. With the net closing in, Quao decided to leave Paris and took Victoria to England in April 1999. The pair settled in London and shortly after their arrival, Quao and Victoria visited Esther Acker, who was a distant relative by marriage of Marie Therese. I had just come from work from the hospital. Then I saw this bubbly little girl smiling, you know, jumping about. Oh, this is Anna. We started chatting. Obviously, the girl knew she wasn't Anna, but she, she was responding to Anna because she had been briefed that way. It wasn't long before Esther began to sense something was wrong. The only thing about the child was that the child was wearing a wig. And I found it very peculiar. And we took the wig off, in fact, and there were little blisters on the head. And he said the child had some um, uh, either hot water accident or something. So, you know, that's it. The child was quite happy wearing the wig. When he took it off, he just put it back on. Six weeks later, Esther Aka bumped into the pair in the street, and she was shocked at Victoria's appearance. I noticed a scar on the right cheek of Victoria. And I said, what's happened to the child cheek, you know, this bruising or scar? And she told me that the child um, fell from escalator. They were going to the city and fell now, and the escalator called the bruising. Esther was sufficiently worried about Victoria that she arranged to visit the pair at their new home, a hostel in Nickel Road, North London. Victoria had lost weight, and Esther was so concerned about both her health and her living conditions that she decided to take matters into her own hands. I rang Brent Social Services. I had visited a girl called Anna. They lived in this address. I made it clear, and I told them my concerns, that the house wasn't very clean, was dirty, people were smoking, and the room was small and untidy, and Anna didn't look very well. I would want somebody to go there urgently to investigate. So whoever took the referral reassured me that somebody was going to go urgently. Esther even made a second call to the social services to check on progress. And once again, she was assured that action would be taken. In reality, nothing was done and her report was lost in the system. If a member of a community was not trained as a frontline social worker, was not trained as a professional, detected that Victoria was being neglected or had concerns around the welfare of Victoria and went on to notify the relevant authorities, I believe here the professional should have done better. By the middle of June, Marie Therese had secured a job at a local hospital. She had arranged that Victoria be looked after by a local childminder, Priscilla Cameron, and her daughter, Avril. She stayed with us each day during the week. Quite friendly, you like to smile a lot, quite a lot. And um, she took a shine to my brother, Patrick. Patrick managed to bring out, I think for the first time she, she's arrived in England, that entertaining nature from this child. He was the only person she danced to. She, she loved dancing and she was showing him what the, the local dance from her country was. If she's ever had any time as a child, as a child should have been, it was that time she spent at the Cameron's house. Despite the happiness and laughter, the Camerons noticed a change come over Victoria when it was time to go home. When Mary arrived, Straight away, she'll be, you know, talking to her in French, and from what I can see, it's, it's not a good conversation. You know, she looks agitated. Quao would call Victoria wicked, which certainly by most people's standards is a fairly extreme term to use to describe a young girl. I said to my mum, that doesn't seem right. Why would she come and, you know, shouting at the child? As well as their unease, Priscilla and her daughter began to notice something more sinister. Mrs. Cameron started to notice things about Victoria's condition. Cuts on Victoria's fingers, 
We asked her, Mary, why she's got cuts in her, on her fingers. And uh, she said, oh, she finds the razor blades and she just sits there and she just cuts herself. Well, we thought that was strange because why would a child, you know, just sit down and cut, cut themselves with a razor blade? At the beginning of July, Marie Therese and Victoria moved into the flat of Marie Therese's new boyfriend, Carl Manning, a bus driver she had met a month earlier. It was a relationship that would ultimately result in the torture and death of Victoria. Victoria Climbier had moved to the UK from the Ivory Coast in April 1999. Her aunt, Marie Therese Quau, had convinced Victoria's parents to let her take their daughter to Europe to be educated. However, Victoria's well-being was the last thing on her aunt's mind. After a short stay in a hostel, Victoria and Marie Therese had moved in with 26-year-old local man, Carl Manning. They met on a bus, he was a bus driver, um, she met him, and she's a very manipulative individual and quite sophisticated. And within a very short period of time, phone numbers had been exchanged and, uh, and they then started to see each other. And in an even shorter period of time, uh, of course, she then moved into his flat. Manning was a lot younger than uh, the QAO. Uh, he was a single man, um, didn't really have much of a social life, uh, hadn't really had many girlfriends, um, supported himself, owned his own flat. Manning lived in a bedsit in the Somerset Gardens in Tottenham. It was a small flat. It consisted of a double bed and a sofa bed in one room, and then a kitchen and a, a tiny bathroom leading off that room. In these cramped conditions, Quao and Manning began a relationship. A relationship that left little room for Victoria. It's pretty clear that Manning had a serious problem with Victoria and didn't want her around. Victoria became more and more of a burden on the couple, and as a result, Quao decided on a drastic course of action. She turned up with Anna and some bags were closed in them. And um, she said to, to my mother that um, the person that she's living with, he doesn't want Anna there, so if my mother can keep her. So my mom said, listen, I'll keep her for, for the evening. It is late. I'll keep her for the night. And then tomorrow you, you've got to find somewhere for this child. You can't abandon this child. It is your child. As Victoria entered the house, her appearance shocked the Camerons. Anna had a hat on, and my mom said, um, Anna, you're in the house, you know, take your hat off. She took the hat off, and then we saw these injuries. The, the injuries, some of them were fresh, so she was recently beaten. There was a cut over her right eye. There was um, a healing burn on her right cheek. It was horrific to see that. And out of all this, this girl was smiling. Yeah. Faced with this appalling sight, Avril Cameron took Victoria to the Central Middlesex Hospital. I went through what I thought what, what, what was happening. And I said, listen, I don't normally do this because it's someone else's child. I don't know if I'm doing the right thing, but I'm seeing injuries and I've took it upon myself to take, you know, bring the child to the hospital. Eventually, in, sometime in the afternoon, the doctor saw us. Uh, she took about two hours to examine her from head to toe. And it's only when she took her clothes off that we saw more injuries and there were strange marks. So she asked me, do you know what these marks are? And I said, no. She said, these are cigarette burns and they're all along her thighs. Uh, across her back, there was a, a mark right across. And then there was one right across her legs. And she turned to me and she said, okay, I've done my examination and I can say to you, these are non-accidental injuries. And she said, um, I, I will have to put certain things in place. So she said, the first thing I'll do, I'll ring social services. In my mind, I'm saying, well, at least something's happening now. 
The following morning, however, a senior consultant diagnosed Victoria's injuries as scabies, an infectious disease that causes rashes on the skin. Because people had suspected a non-accidental injury, she was initially placed under police protection. But when the alternative diagnosis of scabies was mooted, that police protection was lifted. And there does seem to have been a problem with that hospital about coordination of these different diagnoses and different opinions about what might be happening to Victoria. But the effect, in any event, was that Victoria was kept in one night and was then discharged back home to Quau. I just felt angry, frustrated, um, and, you know, sort of feeling of hope, hopelessness because I knew what I saw. And for the doctor to say, rashes, Excuse me, what about the burn on her face, the cut over, over her eyes? I'm not a medical person, but I know the difference between a rash and a cut. Apart from a brief glimpse of her walking down the street, the Camerons were never to see Victoria alive again. Only a week later, she would be back in hospital. Victoria was taken to the North Middlesex Hospital by Quau. The explanation was that Victoria had scolded herself in the bath. Uh, Quau said that in an attempt to alleviate the itching from the scabies, Victoria had held her own head under the hot tap. Uh, a rather surprising explanation given the severity of the scolds. When you look at those graphic injuries and the burning of Victoria's face, one thing that Mary Trace could never have taken away from Victoria was that smile. There were some amazing stories coming from some of the nurses about Victoria. And one thing, even though it's 10 years ago, one piece of evidence will always stay in my mind from one especially caring nurse who'd spent a lot of time with Victoria. And she describes providing Victoria with some dressing up clothes from a dressing up box that the hospital kept. And she described this pretty little girl dressed up in pink Wellington boots and some sort of party outfit, going twirling down the ward full of happiness and joy and uh, described by nurses then and subsequently as a little ray of sunshine. Although Victoria appeared to have enjoyed her time on the ward, nurses began to notice a change come over her on the rare occasions that Quau visited. I think it's recorded on the nursing notes that the relationship between Quau and Victoria is more master and servant than that of mother and daughter, and that there's a really vivid description of um, Quau telling Victoria off. And Victoria is, is standing to attention out of her hospital bed, and she's actually so frightened that she wet herself. Not only were those signs missed, but evidence that Victoria was suffering serious physical harm was also tragically overlooked. One nurse noted a belt buckle mark another noticed burns to Victoria. And this is the point at which everything did go very badly wrong because if everything had been brought together properly, social services would have and should have called a child protection conference. And that's when everybody, all the professionals and all the different aspects of a child's life can come together and share your notes and your concerns. This conference was never called. And despite the seemingly mounting evidence, a series of misunderstandings and ineffective communication between medical staff, social services and the police meant that the signs of Victoria's abuse that should have prompted action by the authorities were ignored. She was discharged on the 6th of August and returned to Carl Manning's flat. Somehow the doctor's concerns and the nurse's concerns, there had been nurses who had been worried too, people didn't bring it together. And at, at some level at the hospital, they said, fine, you can take the child home. I mean, not really looking to blame at, at anyone, but at no time, in no way, Victoria Klimbier should have been returned in the hands of Marie Therese Quavo. On leaving the hospital, Victoria's case became the responsibility of Haringey Social Services. She had been assigned to a social worker called Lisa Arthurwari. Lisa Arthurwari had only been qualified for 18 months, and that's pretty new for a social worker. She ought to have been subject to really quite close supervision by those senior to her, and she was not. Initially, her task was to check that everything was all right. 
So it was a let's see how things look at home. Mr. Manning, yes. I'm here to see Marriage Wales. When Lisa went to visit this, this family at their, their house, there, it seemed to her to, to be a much better house or flat than most of the other um, families she, were visit she was visiting. It was neat, it was tidy, it was clean. Manning and Quayo were well presented, the child was well presented, the child seemed happy. Although Lisa Arthur Worry was satisfied with Victoria's living conditions, tellingly she admits never actually speaking to her in person. Had she done so, perhaps she would have uncovered quite how desperate Victoria's life was becoming. As the abuse of Victoria got worse, um, she started to become incontinent. And it got so bad, and the sofa she was sleeping on got so badly soiled, that Quow and Manning threw it out, with the result that Victoria now, now had nowhere to sleep. The solution that Quow and Manning came up with in that situation was to force Victoria to sleep in the bathroom. As if these conditions were not appalling enough, the winter of 1999 marked a significant increase in the physical abuse Victoria was subjected to. This child began to sustain some of the most extreme physical abuse I've ever come across. The murder of Victoria Climbier shocked Britain. An eight-year-old girl from the Ivory Coast, brought to the UK by a relative, Victoria was subjected to the most horrific abuse, eventually leading to her death at the hands of her aunt, Marie Therese Quau, and her aunt's partner, Carl Manning. By the autumn of 1999, Victoria had been seen by two local hospitals, three separate social services, and the police. Despite this, the abuse she was subjected to had been allowed to carry on. Social worker Lisa Arthur Worry had visited Victoria at Manning's flat and was satisfied that she was being properly cared for. Like everyone who came into contact with the pair, she assumed that she was dealing with a mother and her daughter. The previous August, Quow had applied for a council house and in October, Lisa had arrived to deliver the result of the application. Lisa made a second visit to Quow and she went and told her that their housing application had been unsuccessful. She got very upset and Victoria, this is an example of how well trained she was, chipped in and appeared almost, to, you know, with hindsight to have been taught to say this, said, why can't you find us a home? You do not respect my mummy. But Lisa said, no, this is the situation and basically we could only find accommodation for you if the child was at risk in some way. And she left at October the 28th. Three days later, she receives a phone call from Quow who's hysterical. I want to make an appointment. In fact, I want to come in straight away who claims that the child has been abused by Manning. Lisa immediately says she must come to the office straight away and she comes with the child. Now the alarm bells immediately rang for the social workers because amongst other things, Crown brought Manning, who supposedly was abusing this little girl, with her. And they were sitting, all three of them, in the waiting room. Quow was interviewed by Lisa and a colleague who explained the implications of her allegation. It was made clear to her that this was a very serious situation um, and it would trigger all sorts of repercussions, including that Carl Manning would be arrested, possibly uh, remanded in prison, and Victoria would need to be examined, all sorts of things like that. The measure this gives you of the woman is an utterly heartless woman who would have subjected an innocent child to the traumatic pro procedures of a sexual abuse investigation just to get her hands on the key to a council flat. And that probably, with hindsight, should have triggered deep alarms about her moral character and her maternal, the strength of her maternal feeling to this little girl. Tragically, these signs went unnoticed, and when Quow realised the implications of her allegation, she quickly withdrew it. Given the seriousness of the situation, and despite the retraction, it seems unthinkable that Victoria would be allowed to stay in the same flat as Carl Manning. Nevertheless, this is exactly what happened. Victoria returned to Somerset Gardens, leaving the social workers to decide on further action. What happens next is 15 actions were decided for Lisa to enact. She wrote to Crowell suggesting a meeting, got no reply. She rang her mobile, her messages were ignored. She made a spot visit um, at 6.30 um, after work in her own time, um, banged on the door, no reply. She requested police assistance and tracing her, nothing much happened. She didn't know what else she was supposed to do. 
Although Lisa was unclear on her next course of action, it seems her managers had already made the decision for her. The manager instructed, and this is a direct quote, complete appropriate paperwork, then NFA, meaning no further action. And basically she was told to close the case. So she closed the case, as she had been told to do. Victoria's file was closed, and probably one of the last chances to save her life had been missed. She would not be seen by any professionals from the health or social services for the next four months, during which time she would be subjected to the most inhumane conditions imaginable. She was put to bed every night in an unheated, unlit bathroom, wrapped up inside a black plastic bin liner with no blankets or sheets. She was, in addition, tied so that she couldn't get out. Her hands were tied with masking tape, and the bag was tied up around her. The treatment of her as she got weaker seemed to be getting worse. They're not feeding her, and then they're giving her a food on a plastic plate, and they're tying up her hands so she couldn't even eat with her hands at the end. Victoria could only eat by pushing her face into the plate like a dog might, um, except, of course, that dogs aren't normally tied up in black plastic bin liners. So the conditions were about as appalling as it's possible to imagine. There were attempts by social workers to call on her towards the end of her life, and they would ring the doorbell, and uh, nobody would come. And after they'd done this two or three times, they concluded that Crow and Manning must have moved away, and so they did nothing about it. Whereas in truth, the chances are that on the other side of that doorway was a deserted flat with a little girl tied up in a bath. The state she was in must have been indescribable. And I think it made it worse that she never knew if this was ever going to end. On the few occasions that Victoria left Manning's flat during this period, Quao would take her to local churches, claiming that possession by evil spirits were causing Victoria's injuries and incontinence. On the 24th of February, Quao took Victoria to one of the churches she'd attended. Somebody at the church looked at Victoria and could see just how appallingly unwell she was and insisted that Quao took her to hospital. Uh, they got a taxi and the taxi took her to some an ambulance station and the ambulance took her to uh, the North Middlesex Hospital where she was admitted in a shocking state. She was suffering from hypothermia. Her body temperature had fallen so far that the hospital couldn't find a thermometer uh, with the capacity to read her body temperature. The injuries to her body were too numerous to count and she was dying. When it became clear that the North Middlesex could do no more for her, they arranged for her to be transferred to the Paediatric Intensive Care Unit at St Mary's Paddington, and she was transported there by ambulance. The staff at St Mary's did all they could for her, but sadly, later that day, during the course of the afternoon, Victoria, who was then aged eight years and three months, passed away. The death of Victoria Climbier marked the start of a police investigation and trial that would uncover one of the worst cases of child abuse in British history, one that would result in dramatic changes to the law. Victoria Climbier arrived in the UK in April 1999. She was brought by her aunt Marie Therese Quau on the pretense of providing the child with a Western education. In reality, Victoria was part of Quau's plan to access benefits. And when the plan went awry, Victoria bore the brunt of her aunt's frustration and violence. She was subjected to months of appalling physical abuse, living in horrific conditions, until, in February 2000, her body simply gave up, and she died. Victoria's aunt was immediately arrested at the hospital, and a murder investigation was launched. <laughs> Once we started to interview Marie Therese, it was very clear that she was uh, attempting to obstruct the police. Uh, she wasn't uh, being straightforward with her answers and she wouldn't assist or cooperate in any way and denied any allegations that were put to her. Quow's boyfriend, Carl Manning, was arrested the following day at his flat in North London. In his interview, detectives were taken aback by his honesty. Manning spoke of how she'd been assaulted with a bicycle chain, causing injuries to her body and her head. He also used a shoe to assault her, he punched her. And later in the trial we discovered that Marie Therese used a hammer to hit her feet. 
he said in answer to one of our questions that that was the thing about Victoria, you could hit her time and time again and she could always take it, which is uh, sickening. Along with the interview statements, detectives also visited Manning's flat to collect forensic evidence. We discovered that there were many bottles of bleach there and this flat had been cleaned and given that Manning had uh, not been arrested until the day after Kuei had been arrested, then he'd obviously used that time to try and clean the flat. But even though the bleach had been used, our forensic techniques managed to recover uh, samples of blood from the walls and the bath, uh, from furniture in the, in the main room and from furniture in the bedroom as well. And we, we managed to recover many, many samples of blood. Now, given that they'd already been cleaned, I think that gave an indication of, of exactly what had, what had happened there. She had been assaulted regularly and severely, and she'd bled. And even though they'd attempted to cover this up, it must have been in abundance. We found tapings that had been abandoned. Uh, they'd been thrown out with the rubbish, but we managed to recover those. And these were clearly the bindings that had been used to, uh, to restrain Victoria by her wrists and her ankles. As well as the search for forensic evidence, detectives were also tasked with positively identifying who the dead girl was. Throughout her life in the UK, she was known as Anna. A passport found in Manning's flat seemed to confirm this, but detectives were shocked when they realized the picture of the child in the passport was not the girl now lying in a London mortuary. After weeks of investigation, police managed to contact who they thought were her parents, currently 3,000 miles away in the Ivory Coast. That was a very difficult conversation because we had trained family liaison officers but they were ringing to find out whether or not this child was their child and then to inform them that the, this child had died. Uh, they were able to confirm that Victoria had gone with Marie Therese and at that point we started to realise that this was their child and she was in fact Victoria Colombier. And we had to then bring them over for the worst journey of their lives to come to the UK and identify their child. With Victoria positively identified and buoyed by the mounting evidence, the detectives felt confident they had a solid case against Quao and Manning. Marie Therese Kuao and Carl Manning were both charged with murder uh, and they appeared before a jury at the Old Bailey on the 20th of November and that trial lasted until the 12th of January. This was never going to be a straightforward case or indeed an easy case. Marie Therese Kuao's defence was that Victoria's condition was due to the fact that she was possessed by demons. There will be times when what they say may cause you distress. And she maintained that throughout. Carl Manning, on the other hand, realizing from an early stage that he was probably going to have to accept his responsibility for ill-treating this child, his defense was, although I'm responsible for injuring her, at the time that I injured her, I didn't intend to cause her really serious bodily harm, and I certainly didn't intend to kill her. Whilst Manning at least accepted some responsibility, Quao, on the other hand, showed no remorse whatsoever. Her behaviour throughout the trial shocked everyone present. The way she chuckled in such a menacing way and laughed dismissively. Yes, it, it, it made the hair stand on the back of my neck. This is the only time I have genuinely felt I was in the presence of evil. The jury took four days to convict um, and during that time there was a lot of speculation but eventually the jury returned a guilty verdict for murder on both defendants. During the course of the trial, Quao and Manning never once offered a satisfactory explanation as to why they treated Victoria in the way they did. They were sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Victoria Climbier. Despite the murderers being convicted, it was clear that questions as to how this was allowed to happen still remained unanswered. For this reason, the British government ordered that a public inquiry be set up to investigate the circumstances surrounding Victoria's death. Well, the reason why Parliament decided to establish the inquiry was because, first of all, the nation was shocked by the suffering 
of this poor little girl that had come to this country for a better education and for new life opportunities. But secondly, it wasn't as if this child died unknown to the key services. In fact, the opposite was the case. She'd had contact with four different local authorities. She'd been on the books of two different uh, police child protection teams. She'd been admitted to two different hospitals. And yet she was still being described as a housing case by the end of her life. Victoria's parents were invited to attend the inquiry and were present throughout the proceedings. During the criminal trial, they were called as witnesses and therefore excluded from much of the evidence heard at the Old Bailey. This would be the first time they would hear first-hand accounts of what had happened to their daughter. Everyone who had contact with Victoria, from friends and neighbours to social workers, hospital staff and police officers, were asked about their actions and to explain them. The inquiry also made a legal first when the decision was made to call Victoria's murderers to give evidence. Quow wouldn't cooperate and wouldn't give her evidence by video link as we had asked her to, uh, whereas Manning did. Uh, Quow, as a result, had to be brought from prison to give evidence. Please provide me with more detail. She was a fairly extraordinary witness. Uh, she was not prepared to answer any questions in truth. She just wanted to rant at the world. It was an absolute pantomime from the minute she walked into the room. I said, I've not done anything. So I don't know why you're looking at me like I'm guilty. She was shrieking at the top of her voice and refusing to sit down and then and then when she sat down after shrieking, refusing to answer questions initially and just being very, very difficult. One of the most shocking moments in the inquiry room was during Quow's evidence when she turned on Victoria's parents, the parents of the girl she had murdered. She was pointedly trying to make comments to them that she knew would hurt them. She suggested that they weren't legally married, which, and hadn't been married in a church, which of course is of no significance at all to anybody um, in the scheme of everything. But to them, it was a particularly hurtful insult and it was directed to hurt. And it just seemed that after everything that had happened, not one ounce of remorse, not one acceptance of anything, and just looking for ways to injure them more than she'd done already. They sat in front of, of me every day throughout the inquiry, and I thought that they were not only brave, but they were dignified. And I think that they commanded the respect of everybody in the room. Amongst the hundreds of witnesses called to the inquiry was Lisa Arthurwari, who had bore the brunt of the press outrage surrounding Victoria's death. When uh, Lisa Arthurwari gave evidence, uh, she was in a very fragile state. I did feel somewhat sorry for her, because as I have said, I don't feel that she was the principal villain in the piece by any stretch of the imagination. She was a young, overworked, a social worker, not properly supervised, uh, whose managers let her down. The Climbier inquiry ran for over a year, and more than 160 witnesses were called. At the end of the process, it was clear that Victoria had been let down by those entrusted with her well-being. The report concluded that there were at least 12 occasions uh, during the course of Victoria's short life in the UK when agencies had the chance to intervene and save her and missed them. This was not the failure of one individual member of staff in whichever service. And it was not due to somebody, one individual, missing um, some important factor. The whole system failed. And that was the most compelling aspect of the inquiry. The real people responsible for Victoria's death were Quow and Manning, the two convicted of her murder. And um, I think it's important not to lose sight of that when you're reviewing what the agencies could and should have done. Nonetheless, there were faults in what the agencies had done, and the inquiry's report makes recommendations for changes to the way they work. Those changes have uh, been reflected in legislation with the passing of a 
um, new Act of Parliament and in the passage of new guidance that is now used by social work departments up and down the country. In future, services for children must be sent. In the early hours of the 25th of February 2000, a young child was brought to the intensive care unit of a central London hospital with signs of horrific physical abuse. It was incredibly difficult to comprehend how anybody could do that to a child. Despite the best efforts of the medical team, the girl died later that day. She was eight years old. The pathologist who carried out the post-mortem discovered injuries to every part of her body. As he put it, there wasn't a part of her that was spared. The cause of her death and the investigation into how it was allowed to happen led to the most extensive inquiry into child protection in British history. It was a crime that shook Britain. St Mary's Hospital, London, and an eight-year-old girl was declared dead after a 13-hour battle for life. It was immediately clear to the doctors who tried to save her that the young child had been subjected to the most appalling treatment. The doctors there talk of her core temperature being so low they couldn't actually read the temperature on their normal equipment. When Dr Curry examined her after she died, he found in excess of 120 injuries on in her body. I mean, this poor child had, had had fought these conditions for so many months, but eventually her body just gave up. Suspicion immediately began to fall on the child's guardians. Marie Therese Coelho, who was her apparent carer, she was arrested at the time. And following her arrest, a day later, her boyfriend, Carl Don Manning, was arrested at the flat in Tottenham. And this is when the event started to begin to be unraveled. It soon became clear to detectives that almost everything they thought they knew about the dead girl was wrong, even down to her identity. Only when police began to question the suspects did the real story begin to emerge, starting with the child's name, Victoria Climbier. Victoria was born on the 2nd of November 1991 in Abobo, the village where she was brought up, which is a small village in Ivory Coast. She was a really happy child, sang all the time, danced about a lot. She was a central figure within her family. She was very helpful. She was the entertainer um, of the family. Shortly before her seventh birthday, Victoria and her family were visited by Mary Therese Quau, who was Victoria's great aunt on her father's side. Quau was 42 and had lived in France for some years. In October 1998, she returned to the Ivory Coast with a proposition for the Climbier family. She offered to take one of their children back to France and have the child educated. This seemed to be an offer that would bring prosperity for uh, Victoria. So they were happy with this and this is a process that takes place in that area of the world on a regular basis and it's tried and trusted and this was a, this was a relative. Quao was somebody that they knew well she was the head of the family at the time. She was a French citizen, apparently, from their perception, incredibly wealthy. One of the analogies that's been suggested to me is, you know, somebody offering you, say, to send your child to, you know, Eton or Harrow and then educate them at Oxbridge and all that that would provide. And of course it's like that, but of course it's even greater. It's a much greater advantage than that. The kind of opportunity that would change your child's life forever. In a twist of fate, it seems that Victoria was not the original child chosen by her aunt to take to Europe. 